Happy Wednesday, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Rocketeer Minute, where each and every day, Monday through Friday, we go over one minute of the greatest adventure movie Walt Disney's ever made, the 1991 Joe Johnston-directed feature, The Rocketeer. I'm one of your hosts, Jim O'Kane of TVDads.com. And I'm Hal Bryan, an airplane nerd from the Experimental Aircraft Association here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And here we are, Jim, in minute 88, this iconic scene with uh, the Rocketeer flying into Griffith Park past the Astronomer's Monument, uh, landing right there, giving Jenny her first real glimpse of just what it is Cliff has been talking about and has been up to all along. And what a pleasure it is to welcome back uh, yesterday's guest, uh, Dr. Ed Krupp, for the director of the Griffith Observatory. Dr. Krupp, thanks so much for coming back and spending more time with us. Uh, delighted, and I got to tell you, when I see that scene again, it still makes me a little nervous to see him come <laughs> flying down and landing next to the monument like right, that with, with fire and everything <laughs> yeah. else. Now, yeah. We were talking, uh, we were talking a bit uh, uh, before we started uh, recording um, about uh, sort of what was what was okay to shoot around the observatory and and uh, and what wasn't. And um, maybe before we get too far into this minute, you could tell us a little, a little bit about what you were sharing about uh, the the one section you, you weren't able to permit uh, the production company to use uh, for shooting. Yeah, w- when you see the observatory, of course, you, you, you see a building, you see the grounds, and, and that's all uh, pretty reasonable territory for, for most filming. Uh, but it is a historic landmark building, and there are lots of sensitive places, not the least of which uh, is uh, the, the copper on the various domes and roofs. There are actually three domes on the observatory. It gives it its very... Uh, specific and and characteristic shape and there's a fourth uh, structure as well a a cupola that's over the Foucault pendulum that swings back and forth inside the building and demonstrates how the the earth is turning in real time well that that cupola likewise is is historic copper and uh, at the time of uh, production production planning um, it was clear that uh, the the team wanted, in fact, to do some scenes up there. Um, I had earlier been involved with the restoration of the the copper, uh, and that was no small task. I mean, I had the whole building, the the Maiden Dome, in like a giant bird cage of scaffolding uh, in order to clean all of the copper off and and smaller ones for the other areas. So I had learned more than I ever wanted to know about historic metals <laughs> by the time uh, that was done in, in 84, 85 or so. Uh, and, and so I was sensitive uh, to, the, to the metal. And and when the uh, the production crew was explaining to me how they wanted to be up on the roof and, and uh, doing various scenes and uh, such, I, I just wouldn't permit the the activity on that metal they wanted to be in and around and on the the cupola and that that just was a sensitive area and couldn't be done uh and yet it was critical and of course if as you watch the film and you you get to those parts you see how how critical that scene was it's very dramatic uh i i certainly don't fault the the visualization it's exactly right but that meant uh that the uh the, the the movie team had to create a fake cupola uh, that looked just like the real one, uh, looked like it was made out of copper, and replicate all of that historic uh, uh, work on, on the ornamentation of it. And it was uh, out really essentially on, on an open lot, uh, way to the northwest of Los Angeles, outside the uh, Los Angeles proper, uh, which is where they they had that and did the shots that they needed for for those close-ups of, with that uh, that roof. Uh, and, and so they never did get close to the copper and standing on it. Now you actually went out and saw the, uh, I did, the set yeah. that they built. Yeah, I went out to have a look at. I, I figured, you know, if somebody's gone to the trouble of of making one of these, I need to see what it looks like too. And I'll tell you, they did a good job. I, I was impressed. I photographed it. We eventually published pictures in our own small monthly magazine, the Griffith Observer, because uh, it it's just another example of, of of how the world has taken to Griffith Observatory. Oh wow! Well, we'd love to uh, love to maybe try to track down those pictures oh, if there's any easy possibility. To do. Easy to do. Yeah. Ah, excellent. I was wondering when we're watching, as we watch the Rocketeer land here in a in a puddle of dry ice, uh, <laughs> uh, we can see the the classic uh, Griffith Park uh, street lights that are uh, yeah. scattered around. I was wondering how much did they have to backdress the, uh, you know, take the '90s out of the park? Is, is that pretty much still all the same as it is? I mean, I would think that you'd have to probably lay out some stuff over the top of the. Um, modern uh, uh, signage and, and things. I, I almost shudder to tell you 
how long the original street lights remained in in place. Um, it and and what those electrical circuits were like and the caps. I mean, it, it was a horror story actually, and and one that got very expensive because it, it was um, a high voltage circuit, and it eventually got to the point where uh, regular wow. city electricians wouldn't okay. even work on it. So, yep, it was authentic. That was the old stuff. Uh, and, and in fact, if if you visit today, I'm very pleased to tell you that that underground uh, electrical circuit has been upgraded can be worked on much more easily and but the lights f- fundamentally look the same uh, if you look in detail you'll see some interesting things today um, we, we cap the tops of those what what look like the the, the glass uh, uh, a bowl or, or, or not really spheres but they're they're sort of cone shaped uh, uh, light uh, fixtures on top of them uh, but just from the point of view of, of light pollution uh, those are coated on the inside but but you when you look at the lamps again you you would have the sense that this goes back to the beginning that's what they look like and even now when whenever we do a- any kind of uh, improvement or change in the building we always look at it from the perspective of the historic integrity of the building uh, it doesn't mean that you you can't make some changes but they need to to, to fit uh, what the place is is really all about it has a timeless quality uh, that deserves much more than well let me just find out whatever is expedient and, and use that here now so we work hard actually to preserve that that sensibility uh, that the observatory came onto the planet with do you, do you also work toward the the dark skies project of, of reducing light pollution generally through the park we, yeah we, we do although I'll tell you uh, and anyone who who uh, uh, <laughs> spoke for a minute and to listen to me in the middle of Los Angeles talking about self-righteously a uh, light pollution you, you you know it's a little bit a little bit wrong for us to be doing it but we obviously are allied with those principles um, the, the more light that we throw in the sky the less sky we see and and so certainly around the observatory uh, we do minimize we certainly minimize light that is thrown in the sky but we also minimize light that is around on the grounds and I th- I think that that all all of us could do a much better job of, of not wasting light. Uh, that that uh, there, there's light that just gets put on for for reasons people think have to do with security that actually make it harder to see in, in the dark. And and so we are we are quite conscious of those. But nonetheless, uh, we are in the middle of a of a huge city, an ocean of light, uh, and it's a very. I mean, you can't see the Milky Way from Griffith Observatory with your own eyes. The only place you can see it is inside the the Samuel Ocean Planetarium inside the building <laughs> wow that's yeah it's it's sad and I, I would imagine that that that's the same sky that mount uh, wilson and mount palomar are, are dealing with it th- too there i mean it- to, to a degree um uh, mount wilson uh is still an, an exquisite astronomical observatory site uh and while the, its skies are much brighter than it was in the 19th century when it was first built and and through much of the 20th um it's still possible to do uh, lots of very valuable research there and part of the reason is that it is up above the whole los angeles basin and especially when clouds come in uh to the basin i mean that really knocks out a, a lot of the light but but they're working in territory astronomers have learned to adapt uh but encroachment of of urban lighting is of course something that all observatories face same is true of palomar mountain uh, and the the Palomar Observatory, uh, so famous there, uh, it too primarily uh, has to contend with the lights of Escondido and San Diego. Wow, and especially when they're they're making movies on top of on top yeah. in yeah. Hollywood Land. It it is speaking of light. It, it's amazing as uh, as the Rocketeer here marches down through the line of gangsters. How well lit the uh, the, the lawn and everything. It's just like daytime pretty much. It and, and yet it has the feeling. That it's normal and night, you yeah. know, it, it, it's kind of it's kind of entertaining. I, I do know that there was a lot of light on the front lawn at that time, though. I mean, anytime there's a film production at night, uh, there there's a tremendous amount of light for the obvious reasons that that's what you need to, to film. But it but it has a has a night nice, has a natural look to it actually. Yeah. Whereas if you were there, it, I, I'm sure maybe in a in an ironic twist, it could have been seen from space. It was so bright with <laughs> yeah. so much light. So it's sort of the other way around from what yeah. you're used to. Uh, yeah. Are those are those boxwood hedges and the little planters? Is I don't think that's part of your uh, your normal flora there. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And and I remember laughing about those. Uh, that, you know, they the art director and uh, all uh, uh, for reasons uh, that had to do with uh, their their sense of the 
the look of the film uh, needed all of those hedges and uh, and though I remember having to approve them and, and say okay it's it's all right to bring those in of course we worried where were they going to be placed and all of that uh, in, in terms of uh, sensitive parts of the ground versus not and, and so on but that 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 was a a reasonable set alteration and and they brought all that in uh, and that kind of thing does happen uh, with, with productions uh, both from the point of view of creating a, a particular atmosphere uh, but also as, as you would guess as well there sometimes things are used to hide things or to, to, to make the emphasis on a particular part of the building stronger. Yeah, I, One of the things I can remember from uh, Griffith Park uh, back many years well not that many years ago i'm just an old man um i'm i'm an east coast guy i grew up in new jersey and i can remember going to the park and seeing these signs that says uh danger rattlesnakes and i would i was walking around the park like oh that's cute it's certain rattlesnakes and i was walking down toward uh, uh bronson canyon where the the bat cave is mm-hmm. and i heard this there was this nice big rattlesnake sitting there and i i guess i mean that is a a thing that you have to deal with the the flora and fauna of uh, of a desert desert terrain there. So, do you have things like coyotes and jackrabbits and stuff coming up? Oh, near oh your- g- gosh, yeah. Now, now, of course, you'd realize um, even though uh, the the place, the park, is, is called an urban wilderness, kind of a strange mix of words. But but that is correctly suggesting um, that there's more than meets the the eye, particularly for daytime visitors. And it is commonplace uh, for deer to wind up on the front lawn of the observatory. It is commonplace to hear uh, in the park, especially from our offices uh, at, at twilight, to hear coyotes in the park. And of course, the coyotes are very urban these days I mean they even just appear in the neighborhoods walking around on 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 the streets that that are are directly adjacent uh, to the park uh, there is in fact a, a very famous uh, mountain lion uh, living in Griffith Park now and and fortunately still alive and hasn't hurt anybody and and is is doing okay but the great shots from automated cameras at night with the Hollywood sign behind <laughs> oh, the mountain no. lion I mean it, it's, it's it's just p- perfect you know so you you, you get uh, all, all of those things including rattlesnakes uh, but they mostly uh, stay out of the way I mean there's far more people around than than wildlife and and wildlife tends to you know withdraw stay away every once in a while you encounter them and i've done this the same thing i was walking uh, up above the observatory on the hills mount hollywood behind us actually going up to take a picture of the place and uh, coming and wearing a three-piece suit of course and good shoes for i mean why i don't know <laughs> but uh i i was walking down the trail and all of a sudden found myself uh with the realization that i caught something in my eye that is, saw something, and I was in the air. Uh, I, I just automatically jumped, and then when I came down and turned around, I saw there was a perfectly fine Pacific rattlesnake just laying out <laughs> on, on the trail, and I was amazed at human instinct and response. But, uh, yeah, you can have those encounters. The, the animals are around here, of course, everywhere. Uh, I've got to switch topics here a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you've, you've been at, at Griffith Park Observatory for, for a while. What was it like your first day on the job there? I mean, it must have been th- – this is kind of a – a dream job for for so, uh, for someone that does what you do. I mean, they, you know, the idea of, of being able to uh, to educate people and inform them and it kind of steer the whole. I mean, this is you're you're a big hunk of Los Angeles and 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 the world. People come to to your site to to talk stars and and learn. Um, what was it like that first day when you were there? Well, you're very kind uh, to, both to say that and to think that way. I fear it's nowhere near as romantic. And I actually began working at the observatory when I was still a graduate student at UCLA. So I, I was really, that became one of one of my another job I had to do. And I didn't want to do it. That was as a part-time planetarium lecturer uh, here. And my advisor at UCLA, who knew the place, who'd worked here as a guide, a rather uh, well-known astronomer, uh, and a sweetheart uh, as well, and a very fine advisor. But he called me in his office and he said, Ed, uh, they've got a uh, opening for a, a part-time planetarium lecture at the Griffith Observatory. I, th- I think you should take the job. Uh, I'd done some of that at, at, at UCLA already in their small planetarium. And I dutifully nodded and I ignored him <laughs> because, uh, you, you know, it was the, the observatory. It wasn't like research astronomy, you know, it was this uh, this. Uh, 
place uh, where lots of people I, I just wasn't interested it didn't seem serious to me at, at the time and so uh, I, I just let it go and then about three weeks later my advisor called me into his office again and said Ed they've got an opening for a part-time planetarium lecture at the Griffith. I think you ought to take it. Uh, so I, I got the message, and I went over and, and, and spoke with uh, the uh, associate director, who was the acting director at the time, and was hired uh, as a planetarium lecturer, had to do some training. And part of the, the thing that happens to new lecturers, the reason they need new lecturers is because uh, – the lecturers that are there get tired of doing the morning school programs and at that time doing a morning school program was nowhere near as as structured an activity as it is today uh, you could hit the whole range of grades and there would be 660 of those kids in the planetarium <laughs> and so you had to learn very quickly you know how in the world do you I mean it's like a circus yeah. how do you maintain control of this so first day of my giving a planetarium, I was chagrined. It was awful, <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I I was asked about it and uh, uh, said uh, I wasn't too happy. And uh, people asked me, you know, well, what's wrong? I says, well, you know, it's show business, and uh, but you get the hang of it. And before a month was out, I was telling people, you know, it's show business. <laughs> and and uh, you, you, you begin to realize what a, a joy and pleasure it is. And you realize you're driving through a park uh, every day. Uh, and uh, I had no intention uh, of working there full time and no intention of staying there. Uh, but all of those things are things that subsequently happen. And that was more than 40 years ago. Right? Yeah, I, I began was a... Uh, as a lecturer in 1970. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow, that's just fantastic! Uh, you know, it, it's it's funny with astronomy. It's such a uh, it, 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 they're so varied. You can get as technical or as non technical as you want, but you still get that feeling just from being able to impart people the size and shape of the universe. Um, I do star parties and, and talks mm -hmm. talks with kids and things like that. And even, it's something simple as I have a. I have like a, I have an eight inch uh, uh, Celestron and set it up and people can look through well, that's it. That's terrific. And, yeah. and just being able to show, I love putting a little kid on a milk box and, and looking through the, you know, looking through the viewfinder and seeing Saturn for the first time. They always say the same thing. It looks fake, but uh, it, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it's just, it's such a joy of seeing people, see, you know, connecting with, you know, with the, with the world around them that they actually find out that they can do this stuff themselves. They can, you know, they can identify stars. They can, they can know how far away things are. Um, that must, I, I would think that was one of your better parts of your job. No question, and I'm delighted that you 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 mentioned that from the perspective of your own personal experience, and so you know it well. Um, it, in fact, people would often ask me, "Well, wh what do you like to see through a telescope most?" And and I immediately always turn that around to what you just said. What I like to see most is people seeing Saturn for the first time through a telescope because it's transformative. It, it really does alter the way people look at themselves and the world around them. And the same thing is true of the phases of Venus or or the craters on the moon all of those things that that wind up being real experiences for people in real time it, it's not something they read in a book books are great it's not something that they saw or heard somewhere it, it's where they were in the moment actually doing it photons from the cosmos coming into their eyes at that instant and and that is what Griffith Observatory is all about that transformation of perspective that comes from the experience that you are giving to people uh, with your telescope and that insight that is marvelous. I would, I'm, I'm sure that you have star parties uh, every every once in a while on your on your grounds at night. Do you do things like that? Is it? Every month we are very very um, uh, richly uh, assisted by the Los Angeles Astronomical Society, Los Angeles Sidewalk Astronomers, who, who bring up uh, as many as, as 50 telescopes uh, on, a, on an evening. Uh, and f starting from the afternoon, when, when they're looking at the sun safely, all the way into the night. And, and those are just out there free for everybody that comes and visits the observatory. And, and again, it's a multiplication of, of that, that, that same experience. Uh, we are blessed with, with partners like that, Friends of the Observatory, who's our, our non-profit and advocacy uh, uh, and fundraising group, uh, also a key partner in all of these things. So we're, we're lucky to have that kind of help. You know, it's funny you mentioned uh, Friends of the Observatory. That was uh, my, my very next note for the next break. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about that. Uh, about that is that's uh, 
that's a, a, a membership organization, right? That's something that we can join. Uh, anybody can join if they want to help support uh, your efforts there. Uh, no, no question. Uh, Friends of the Observatory had to be invented, and it had to be invented out of a recognition that the observatory, and this is, goes back to the 70s and really the late 70s and 80s, uh, the observatory was sort of fine, but it wasn't going to be fine forever because things were wearing out, uh, not to mention the pre- planetarium projector. Uh, and and I, I started thinking, you know, how in the world are we going to get the money and the will and all that need to do that? And started talking around to people and realized that we did need that kind of an independent support group. And, and so they had to be invented. And Deborah Griffith, who was the wife of Harold Griffith, the grandson of the original Colonel Griffith, so this is the family, uh, still had a, a, a sense of commitment uh, to the place. And, and they stepped up to help start Friends of the Observatory, which became a key partner with the city and the Department of Recreation and Parks and the Observatory in this $93 million renovation expansion. So Friends of the Observatory is still very active. Uh, we're, we're Right now we're developing uh, a new uh, ambitious planetarium show. Uh, and uh, these these are not your father's planetarium shows anymore. They're, they are, uh, we still do live programs, but technically they are extraordinary. Um, and, and in being in Hollywood, they have to be extraordinary. I mean, that, that, that's, that's the competition for us. So uh, Friends of the Observatory is, is a key partner in this, and people can certainly find out about the Observatory and Friends of the Observatory by going to the Observatory website, and that's just griffithobservatory.org, www.griffithobservatory.org, and, and there's a button right there to find out about Friends of the Observatory, as well as all the other things that the Observatory has to offer. Well, we'll be sure, of course, to share links uh, to those when this episode uh, is uh, is out there and goes live, so you can you can check sure. that out. I'm going to have to uh, ask you to time travel because we're doing this in the sure. past, but it, it, we're, we're going to be talking about a future event that <laughs> yes. hasn't happened for us, but already happened uh, by the time this is aired. Uh, how did it go with the uh, with the eclipse? Did you have uh, eclipse uh, events back <laughs> last week? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Assuming you know, the Earth wasn't catastrophically yeah. destroyed by an asteroid <laughs> yeah, or something yeah, in yeah, that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eclipses, of course, are always problematic. That's part of their joy. And at Griffith Observatory, uh, the main problem for this problematic eclipse was that everybody was out of town. Uh, the, the, practically the whole observatory staff was, was insistent on leaving to go to the path of totality, which, of course, cut across the United States from the Oregon coast all the way to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and and that meant, in a sense, almost nobody was home. But despite that, uh, the eclipse, the partial eclipse in in Los Angeles, uh, got to the point at maximum of of 70% coverage of the disk, something you can barely tell is taking place if you don't know that it's happening. It isn't that much darkening, but if you looked, as people did, through uh, the official Griffith Observatory Solarama viewer or uh, eclipse glasses uh, that we sold and still sell at the observatory, of course you could see that that eclipse making its progress from the first little bite out of uh, uh, the uh, the upper right of the sun there to uh, uh, the, the maximum coverage and, and then a retreat. So uh, that, of course, course, uh, proceeded at, with a limited crew of support here, but enough. I mean, we, after all, it was in the morning on a Monday and kids are back in school, uh, but it's still a little crazy here. I mean, people people show up uh, and, and this was the most publicized uh, total solar eclipse the world has yet seen. So uh, the, it, it, it was a draw. And of course, across the country, you got mixed results just depending on the weather. That's true. Yeah. That's right. I, th- I was thinking back to uh, I mean, the one that got the most attention, I think, prior to this that I recall in my lifetime, and I, I wish I had a moment to look up the year, I want to say late 70s. Uh, I was living in, uh, either in Northern California or had just moved to Washington. Ah. Um, is that ringing a bell? Was there, uh, was it, there a it, prominent it, one back then? It, well, it might have been uh, the um, the 79 eclipse that went across the the Northwest. Does that sound that sounds right? That sounds just about right. It would yeah, have been and, uh, and, in Washington State at the time. Yeah, yeah and, and that was a winter uh, eclipse as well because uh, uh, a lot of people, there are pictures of people out in the snow, uh, but <laughs> uh, but they, you know, they... they uh, uh, went uh, looking for clear sky, patches of clear sky, if they were either in individual cars or whole buses barreling down the highway. And, and quite, a peop- quite a lot of people, uh, for 
that era uh, did get to see it. Those were the early days, though, of of public solar eclipses. I mean, sure. that it, it hadn't turned into the mass, the worldwide mass attraction uh, that it is today. So there, there, you, you had to be kind of gung ho to go chasing eclipses in the. 70s. I do. I do remember when I was a, when I was a kid. I was living in in New Jersey, and I had just missed the. I, I saw a partial eclipse in 1970. The one that the one that Carly Simon sings about in uh, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Uh, but I. <laughs> Uh, back at the time, I was a I was an often patron of the uh, the old Hayden Planetarium, and one and sure. one of the things they talked about was sometime in the future in 2017 there'll be a total eclipse that'll yeah. go all the way across <laughs> the United States, and I've been waiting for this since I was 10. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get you, and and I hope I hope uh, in in that uh, cupboard of uh, uh, anticipation uh, that that you you had been keeping uh, that you had Halley's Comet in there too yeah. for uh, oh yeah eighty six yeah I, I can I, I went out to a, a stretch in uh, northern Oklahoma that was nice and clear ah, and yeah. managed to see yeah. managed to see the little dust speck and thinking yep. about Mark Twain talking about that same little blob of light and it just that's right it, it really was quite a it, connection. <laughs> It, it, not necessarily a spectacle visually, but from the perspective of history and culture and, and, and the, the connection of generations, it, it was extraordinary. And uh, even though 2017, uh, you know, is over as far as uh, eclipses are concerned, um, the, the remarkable thing is in 2024, there's going to be another one cutting right across the United States, sort of diagonal to the path, uh, and even go right through some of the, uh, the Midwest uh, that uh, the 2017 eclipse did. So uh, we've got another shot at it in 2024 in the U.S. If everybody eat their Wheaties and, and you know keep your vitamins <laughs> going and, and do regular exercise, stay stay around for a couple more for for, for this exactly. next eclipse. Well, uh, Doctor Crowley, if you don't mind, I've got a I've got a very prosaic and silly question about sure. the observatory. Um, do, you, uh, do you by chance know who was responsible for naming the cafe at the end of the universe? Yeah, I kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> because they deserve a raise, yeah, uh, uh, no matter it, what. It, it, very kind. Uh, if you got a minute, I'll tell you a, 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 a amusing story about that. Uh, everything is named at the observatory uh, because that provides uh, specific character identity uh, and, and meaning, uh, not just to visitors, but for, for staff. You know, So we have the Samuel Ocean Planetarium, the Leonard Nimoy Event Horizon, but we've got the Cosmic Connection and the Wormhole and the Center of Gravity and all those things. And, and so certainly the cafe needed to be named properly. Right. And uh, uh, it's, it's a... a um, it's an affectionate allusion, of course, to Douglas Adams, who I knew. Uh, and, really? Uh, uh, so we, um, uh, uh, we just borrowed a, a little bit of Douglas Adams' spirit and, <laughs> and, and put it in there. Oh, that's absolutely terrific. I, I brought this up before on the show, and we had a screenwriter on who uh, had uh, not only we tried out for the part of the Rocketeer, but then worked on the Hitchhiker's Guide uh, adaptation ah, yeah. uh, film later. But, uh, you know, one of my prized possessions is a hand-signed note from Adams uh, saying, don't panic, of course, in large yeah. friendly letters, <laughs> and then below that, and happy 30th birthday. Uh, and I, I got it from him on my birthday and uh, and what that meant. So what a wonderful... Uh, very, very nice. Uh, he, he was a joy and, and left us far too soon. So. Absolutely. I'm so thrilled that I got to meet him, but it just, all it does is leave you wanting more. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been a fantastic, uh, a fantastic bunch of shows. And and Doctor Doctor, thank you so much for for being on here. It's great to talk about this jewel of of Los Angeles. I've I've loved it for years, and, and it's nice to know it's in good hands, um, and, and with somebody who who enjoys it as much as the people who visit do. Um, very kind. Thank you. You're both obviously always welcome here, and that goes for everybody listening. So oh, that's wonderful. Much appreciate. Uh, next time I'm in LA, it's on. It's the number one on my list. Absolutely. Terrific. Wow. Thanks. Well, uh, we will. If if folks would like to talk more about the wonderful time that they had at the eclipse, which we haven't seen yet, uh, <laughs> but I hope you all had a great had a great time there on Monday. Uh, but uh, you can join us on social media, of course, always at the usual locations: uh, Twitter Rocketeer Minute. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com/slash Rocketeer Minute. The big site RocketeerMinute.com, where you can read about this current episode with all the links to Griffith Observatory and, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, also, please find us on iTunes and Google Play. Uh, just go in there, type in Rocketeer Minute, click subscribe, and you can get this delivered hot and fresh every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, we're going to talk some more about uh, things going on with uh, Eddie Valentine and uh, Neville Sinclair and whether or not uh, poor old Cliff is going to get uh, Jenny back. But we'll find out about that tomorrow here on the Rocketeer Minute. So until next time, 
over and out. Get it, kid.